Hi everyone. Today I'm going to show a frequency principle in deep learning. I'm Zhijian Zhang Xu. Uh, I'm from Shanghai Jiao University. So first, I want to show a takeaway information. The frequency principle says, from all the functions that can fit the training data, deep neural networks prefers low frequency ones. Deep neural network learns low frequency ones much faster and can generalize better for low frequency target function. One step further, we also found a deep frequency principle. The effective target function for deep hidden air is the lower frequency function. That means with a deeper hidden layer or deep neural network, the neural network can learn the target function much easier and can generalize better. So we try to understand the effect of depth from Fourier perspective. You can find the paper on my website, and we also have a suggested notation for machine learning on GitHub. So now let's start our story. We know that uh, 30 years ago, people already know a neural network with only single hidden layer can almost fit any function. But this is not the end of story, not even the beginning of story, because fitting is not enough. Let's have a, a very simple example. Let's use a polynomial model to fit some training data shown by these blue data points. If you use a fourth order polynomial function to fit these data points, although the model, the blue line, cannot perfectly fit the training data, but as we can see, it actually captures the true function quite well. When you increase the complexity of the model, such as the number of the parameters, in this example, you just use a higher order polynomial. It can much better fit the training data. But here we can see a very large oscillations. So it deviates from the true function very significantly. So traditional theory says if you increase model complexity, you can decrease the training error. But after some point, you will increase the test error. So there will be a generalization gap. And this gap amplifies as the complexity increases. So Van Neumann has said a very famous word, sentence. With four parameters, you can fit an elephant to a curve. With five, you can make him wingle his trunk. So in physical approach, people always try to as model as much as simple to fit a phenomenon or try to explain something. But in deep neural network, seems things are not so easy. So now let's consider if you have a model, have millions of parameters, but you only have five data points. Will this model overfit the data. So as a neural network, as a black box, it may say, no. Now let's see what's in the story. Here's an example. So in this example, the five training data points are indicated by these red circles or red laws. And you can use different neural network to fit these five data points. As you can see here, although you can increase the number of hidden layers, but the final output of neural network actually are quite similar. They are in some sense quite flat. So one question is, maybe the neural network cannot generate oscillated curve, but actually we can have some oscillated curve that also can fit these five data points. You can just simply put some fake data in some place, just like here, here, and here. And you can also learn the curve, this blue dash line. That can learn all these five data points, but much more oscillated. So here is no question. If we only present 
these five data points. Why neural network always learns a curve with kind of relative flat? And if you increase the, deep, the neural network steps, you can also increase the number of parameters. It seems that's not a get worse, although if you just use a plain network, there's no skip connection, you increase the number of layers, the generalization will get worse, but this can be explained by this uh, gradient disappear, uh, disappear. So if you use a skip connection, you can still find that when you increase the number of, of layers, you increase the number of parameters, the neural network learns faster and the generalization is better. So the question is why? Seems very confused. So in 2016, a paper uh, performed the extensive experiments to show that although the number of parameters of neural network is much larger than the number of the training data, but the deep neural network seems can always gener generalize better without any tricks, just a very plain neural network. So this is quite a very attractive puzzle. So people have also some, uh, some joke to, uh, to criticize, criticize those who are doing deep learning theory. Now let's take a story to see why people, uh, how people say it. So the first guy says, I'm looking for my quarter I dropped. The second one said, did you drop it here? The first one said, no, I dropped it two blocks away, two blocks down the street. Then why are you looking for it here? Because the light is better here. So people, some people may criticize that when you are doing deep learning theory, you are actually doing something you can, not doing something that people really need. But I slightly change this cartoon. I changed the last sentence because I need to get familiar with the load structure first. So we know that the puzzle I just presented here is quite complex when you are looking at a real data set, such as uh, like uh, MNIST or CIFAR 10. All these data actually are very, very high dimensional. It's not easy to understand what happens inside. So. I slightly change this cartoon, just try to present a, a research philosophy. So our approach actually, we will try to discover and characterize dynamical behavior of neural network during the training on synthetic data problems. So this just like you are doing something where light is better and people may criticize, this is not the data we want, okay. But this one will help us to get familiar with what happened in neural network or what happened in this training process. And then we will examine this empirical universe, universality using real data set and deep neural networks and try to claim something happens in the synthetic data also happens in this real data. And then based on these phenomena, we will establish theories for the mechanism to understand what happened. And further, we will try to understand the deep neural network and, and applications and better use deep neural network to solve problems. So now let's take a look of our outline. We will first show the frequency principle is very universal. And we will try to understand the strengths and limit of deep learning uh, through Fourier perspective. And then we'll present what is the frequency principle, why we need deep. And finally, we will present an example of application in design of multi-scale deep neural network based on understanding of frequency principle. So now let's take a look at what is a frequency principle. Suppose we are going to fit a target function presented by this red uh, curve, and we have some training data, and after training, the neural network can fit the target function very well. But we care about the training process. So now let's take a look. This red line is the target function, and this blue dashed line is the 
neural network output at the initial point. And this is a movie. And as the movie goes, means the training step increase. Now let's take a look what happens during the training. So as we can see that the neural network will first capture the landscape. And more and more steps, more and more details, details emerge, more and more details. So how to quantify this effect? It's very naturally to quantify this landscape and these uh, details by Fourier uh, transform. And remember that in the first beginning, we, we are, when we are talking about the generalization, we're talking about a flood, we're talking about oscillation, all this can be naturally quanti quantified by Fourier coefficient. So we perform Fourier transform of the target function. So this blue, this red dashed line is the Fourier transform of this target function. And blue line is the FFT of deep neural network output. Now let's take a look. This amplitude and frequency, how it evolves during the training. As we can see that it can first capture the low frequency one, and then the second peak, and third, and more and more frequency peaks. So this shows a very interesting phenomenon that a deep neural network first captures low frequency ones, and while keeping high frequency ones small, and then gradually, gradually captures high frequency components. Okay, so here is the question. In these examples, low frequency actually also have higher amplitudes. So the question is, is frequency or amplitude that decides the training speed? So now we focus on frequency, so we need to control the amplitude. So we perform another experiment that have three equal amplitude of frequency, sin x, sin 3x, and sin 5x. This is the target function. In the Fourier domain, you have three peaks. Okay, so we will examine the relative error of these three peaks during the training. The error is relative, and here in these pictures, we consider these three peaks, so first, second, and third. And the x-axis is the training epoch. Red means the relative error is very small, and blue means the error is large. So we can see the first frequency converts extremely fast, followed by this second one, and then the third one. So we can see when we control the amplitude, we can still see that the deep neural network prefers low frequency ones. So let's come back to this cartoon when we get familiar with the low structure. Now we need to go back to where we drop our quarter. Otherwise, we're actually making fun, not doing really uh, research. So now let's take a look about the second, the two-dimensional uh, examples. And the two-dimensional example can be uh, something like remember an image. This function actually is from the position to uh, pixels. Uh, okay, so this is a two-dimensional function. This input is location, and this output is grayscale or pixel values. So uh, at 4,000 steps, you can see a kind of landscape structure. And after more training steps, there are more details emerges. So in two, two dimensional examples, you can still visualize this uh, training proce process by this landscape and details. Seems you can still have this frequency principle. But for high dimensional case, actually it's very complicated. And how to do this, how to examine the frequency principle in this high dimensional example is very difficult. So now let's take a look how we do this. So we need to be very clear about what is the frequency in high dimensional examples. So we know the image frequency, like you have two dimensional example, uh, is the mapping from location to grayscale. So if you have one color picture, it's all, almost the all zero frequency. So this is low frequency one, but for these pictures, you have a lot of peaks, so it's a high frequency. So this is the frequency from location to grayscale. But 
when we are doing like uh, imaging classification, note that we are not meaning the image frequency. So what is the frequency? We mean response frequency. So suppose we are doing an image classification, you input an image. So your input is not a two dimension, your input actually is the number of the pixels and your output may be 10 or 2 or 3, depends on how many uh, uh, characteristics you have. So for example, uh, this is a famous ex uh, adversarial example, we will use it to explain what is high frequency. So your input is an image. It's very high frequency. It's a very high dimension. It's a very high dimensional uh, input. And your output is in the label. In this example, it's panda. Then the high frequency means you slightly change your input and you will get a different uh, output. So now the input is slightly changed, right? Okay, so this panda and this one, actually they are almost the same. You cannot uh, uh, tell the difference from your eyes, but the result is, is extremely different. This is a given, right? So uh, the output has a very significant change. That is the high frequency. From the input image from to the labels, this mapping has a high frequency component, so you can attack it. So, but when you consider image frequency inside this two pictures, they are almost the same. So. Uh, in this example, so you cannot say anything about image frequency. You only can say about this response frequency. So now let's take a look at uh, this Fourier transform to understand what's the meaning of high frequency here. So suppose you are doing an um, image classification. Xi is the input image. Yi is the label. So Xi is very high dimensional the number of pixels. When you are doing uh, this uh, Fourier transform, uh, you have this k dot xi here. So the num the dimension of this Fourier domain is the same as the spatial domain of x. So this is in the product. So k here is the frequency what we are meaning in high frequency space. Okay. So to perform this high dimensional frequency uh, uh, Fourier transform, it will suffer from curse of dimensionality. So approach actually we need to do another way. We have a projection way that we only observe the training process on, y on one direction of the frequency domain. Uh, this actually is equivalent to one uh, dimension or one direction in a spatial domain. For example, you just plug in this kp1, p1 is the direction into this formula, so it's equivalent to consider x1 uh, projected on this p1. The other way is we are doing a filtering, meaning we filter this uh, original signal into a high frequency part and low frequency part, and it, you examine this part, these two paths, when they converge, you can see low frequency converge faster. Now let's take a look about these experiments. So for the projection approach, we can see that the relative error, the MNIST or CIFA, they are similar. The on the direction of first uh, principal component, or we can see that low frequency dominates and high frequency actually is small. So we examine the four uh, frequency uh, kind of peaks here or turning point here uh, with respect to training epoch. So uh, similarly, we examine the relative error. So as you can see that the lower frequency actually converge faster and the second of uh, select frequency and the third one. So you can see for this uh, projection method, we can still get this frequency principle similar for this CFR10. So on a filtering method actually just the filter this uh, uh, original signal uh, into low frequency part and high frequency part. And to perform this uh, decomposition, we actually can convolve with a Gaussian function. This Gaussian function just like a low frequency filter. So uh, by doing this convolution, you can get uh, the low frequency part of the original information. And the latter one is high frequency one. So you, you can also perform this convolution for neural network. And then you can get the low frequency part of the neural network and high frequency part. Then you can examine the relative error for low frequency part and high frequency part.
So for um, like deep neural networks, several hidden layers, uh, convolution neural networks or VGG 610, we can get a very similar result for MNIST or CIFAR 10 that low frequency actually converge earlier for different uh, uh, Gaussian width. So this means we keep a different uh, uh, portion of low frequency. So we can still get a low frequency converge faster. That means in even in high frequency space, in high dimensional space, we still have this uh, frequency principle. Now we try to understand what happens or why there is a low frequency principle, right? So we consider a very idealized uh, setting, try to help to understand. So consider a tensed neural network of one hidden layer for fitting a one, one dimensional function. The neural network is presented by hx here. So you perform a Fourier transform of this function and you get this uh, exponentially decaying form with respect to this k, k means frequency. So now let's try to understand why you have this exponentially uh, decay. So sigma here is the tangent function in smooth and spatial domain, so it exponentially decays in Fourier domain. And you can define loss at uh, each frequency, right? A mean square error. And by possible theorem, you can get uh, this loss in frequency domain actually equals to the loss in the uh, uh, spatial domain. And you can compute the gradient by the loss in the Fourier domain, since these two are same, right? So you can see that you actually hear the gradient has a frequency uh, decomposition. Now we try to examine the amplitude of different uh, uh, frequency for the gradient. So you can see that the case frequency of the loss function is gradient with respect to some parameter of theta anyone. So it has a form. This form AK means the difference between the target function and the neural network output at a frequency k. And this exponential decay actually inherits from the uh, Fourier transform of this uh, neural network. And this one actually is origins from origins from the tangent function, um, the activation function. So let's take a look here. And g actually is an order one quantity. It does not matter. So if you have a k larger than zero, means um, this component uh, does not converge yet. So if the w i is the input weight, w i input weight is small, this exponential decay dominant. A low frequency will dominate. Okay, but if you have a k almost equal to zero, then small contribution from l k, the dominance will shift to next frequency. So the inside here actually tells us the smoothness, smoothness or the regularity of activation function can be converted into frequency principle through gradient based training. So this shows an very ideal example, try to understand why there is a frequency principle. The basic reason is you have this kind of continuous activation function, no, no necessary continuous. Uh, once you have this decaying property in Fourier domain, you can inherit into this gradient descent. Uh, so you can have more rigorous uh, theory to show that low frequency gradient as larger than high frequency gradient, almost surely, if this this data means the width, the uh, maximum value of the input weight is going to zero. And as we know, usually the initial weights are very small, so initially you can observe this low frequency principle very clearly. But if you have a large initial weight, things will be very different, right? Uh, here's an example of tension x. If your input weight is very large, you have, will have a sharp change here. And this means high frequency. If you have high frequency here, things will be very uh, chaos. Here's an example. So this example, the target function is this red data points. And this blue data points actually are in a, are the initial um, output of neural network. It fluctuates a lot, and after the training, it still fluctuates a lot, flop a lot at the test data point. In such case, the frequency principle does not hold. Okay, so this is something we should be uh, careful. 
And more generally, uh, if you consider a uh, more general network architecture and more general activation function or loss functions, actually we can have a very general theory, but we assume that data points are uh, kind of infinite uh, for some distribution. So, but you can prove frequency principle in this setting. There are some other related works that also try to explain it uh, uh, theoretically. So these two papers actually the idealized setting we have presented. And this general theory just in the previous page. And this, uh, is, uh, this is an uh, almost same time paper, adopt our analysis for ReLU activation function. And we also have a work that uh, consider two layer neural networks. We have no assumption on data, uh, very few assumptions. Uh, we consider finite data points. So we can consider generalization in this setup. And we can also explicitly show frequency principle. And some other works also uh, uh, use uh, neural, and neural tangent kernel uh, to study uh, this uh, frequency principle or spectral bias. Now let's take a look about uh, our uh, approach for this um, why the two-layer neural networks to understand the frequency principle to quantitatively uh, show the frequency principle. So if you have a very wide neural networks, so people have shown that under some uh, initialization, you can uh, approximate this neural network by first order Taylor expansion at initial data points. So here's some empirical result. In this result, actually, people show uh, the comparison between a neural network and a linearized model. So this is some output value of some uh, neuron, neurons during the training. So you can see that the neural network and linearized model, they actually are quite equal to each other, meaning uh, when you have a wide neural network, it can be uh, approximated by a linearized model, such as random feature model. So in this setting, actually, we can uh, study a very uh, simple two-layer neural network. And we found that <clears throat> we found that uh, the dynamics of neural network output can be characterized by a very simple dynamic function. And in this function, this h hat is the Fourier transform <clears throat> of the neural network output. Cassis uh, frequency. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> so here, these parameters have uh, slightly different uh, with previous one. This R is input weight, W is the output weight. And we found that, that the coefficient in this dynamics actually can be right in a very simple form. This is uh, the kind of second order of uh, parameters. And this is in the second order of the product of parameters. And you have this Cassi, uh, Cassi 4 and Cassi 2. And as Cassi frequency increase, you know that this part will uh, decrease, meaning as you increase, as you have a higher frequency, the coefficient is small. So the dynamics is sm smaller. Now let's take a look at this uh, last part. This f is target function and H is neural network output. P is sample distribution. So when you have discrete sample points, like a, a summation of delta function, then uh, this part actually says the dynamics stops at the training data points, not all the data points. So this is consistent with our training process. So this actually shows a very uh, uh, clear image of the frequency principle. You can characterize the training speed of each frequency. So for simplicity, we can write in this way. This UP means the difference between the neural network output and this uh, target function. So this one actually can be uh, equivalent to the solution of this one at a long term limit. It's equivalent to the solution of an optimization problem. So this optimization problem actually shows more information, kinds of more information. So this only shows the training process, but this one 
give us information of the final learning result. So at the first the beginning, we says the different neural network will choose some function from all from what from all functions that can fit the training data. So this is the uh, subject to this h x i equals to y i means these functions should uh, fit the training data. But the neural network prefers something like this. So this one you have minus here. So this part will be larger as frequency increase, right? So this means that if you have more frequency, higher frequency ones, this quantity will be larger. So this optimization prop actually gives more parity for high frequency components. So this gap uh, goes back to we have said the deep neural networks will choose a low frequency function from all functions that can fit the training data. And more specifically, we can uh, analyze these uh, two parts more carefully. If you any have, if you only have this fourth order term, this one actually is equivalent to a cubic plane for one dimensional case. If you have only uh, this second order term, th then this is a linear plane. So we can numerically uh, verify this. Suppose we that this part much larger in the initial uh, distrib distribution, and we can see that if you have 500 hidden neural number with stars as training data points, uh, the final neural network by this gradient descent after training is very consistent with the prediction of this model. If you have 16,000, uh, you can see that the prediction actually fits the training, training result very, very well, almost cannot tell. And as the neural number increase, the difference actually decrease. And if you let this part is larger, meaning it's a uh, spring, a linear spring, so you can see that uh, it's kind of a piecewise linear function. But in previous case, this part this one here is kind of smooth. It's very similar to cubic plane. So in high dimensional case, actually we can have similar result like this SOR problem. This two data points minus one and this two is plus one. After uh, the training, the neural network output at uh, each data points is very similar as the prediction of this uh, model. And okay, this is a comparison. Uh, this line is y equal x. The y line is the data points from this uh, neural network output, and the x uh, x value is the corresponding one from this uh, reference or the prediction. So you can see that even for high two-dimensional case, uh, our model actually can very well predict the final training result. So this shows a very simple model uh, for us to uh, study two hidden, uh, one hidden layer neural network or two layer neural network. So up here we have uh, shows the universality, universality of the frequency principle that the neural network has a low frequency bias during the training from empirical result from ideal theory and the linear frequency principle model. Next we will utilize the frequency principle to understand the strengths and limit of deep learning. So here's an try to understand the effect of early stopping. So suppose we are going to fit a noise function, this red data points. And this data points have some noise, so you can see some data uh, kind of outliers. So during the training, the training error will decrease, but the text error will increase after some uh, training steps. Uh, we're curious about uh, when uh, we should uh, stop uh, or what happens uh, at this uh, best generalization error point. At this point, you can see the learning result actually is kind of some function. Um, now let's take a look at this Fourier domain to see why some function actually uh, can generalize better. 
So for the training data or the test data, uh, this red data points or this black data points, it has a frequency peak at this point. Uh, so this one, the training and test data actually they only overlaps at the low frequency peaks. In high frequency peaks, they are very different, right? For test data points, it naturally uh, decreases, but for training data, it has a lot of fluctuation. So for deep neural network, it will first learn low frequency peak, right? So it will first learn these peaks, and you will behave like a sum function. And then if you uh, go further, you will uh, learn this high frequency noise, and then we will generalize walls. So the frequency principle pro provides a Fourier perspective to understand why we need early stopping, uh, trying to avoid uh, uh, fitting such noise high frequency information. The next one is uh, to understand the generalization difference at the different tasks. So as we know at the MNIST or at the CIFAR team image classifications, the deep neural networks can perform uh, quite well, um, but that's not good. It's not good at uh, some tasks like parity function. Okay, now let's first to take a look at these two image classification tasks. So as we have shown before that uh, for uh, one direction, you can visualize the Fourier uh, behavior of the function. It's low frequency dominant. So the neural network has a low frequency bias. So these two are consistent, only different at uh, non-important high frequency ones. So the neural network can generalize well, but for parity function, so this function is defined uh, at each coordinate, it only defined at two data points, minus one and one. And the function value is the product of all the coordinates. It counts of like, uh, counts the number of minus one, if you have even minus one as one, odd number is minus one. And this function actually is very fluctuated. So the Fourier transform actually increase the amplitude increase increase as the frequency increase. So for these examples, if you have some samples like this data red data points, uh, you have some aliasing aliasing effect. You can see some false low frequency ones. On the low frequency one, does not uh, accurately uh, reflect the true signal indicated by this. Green line. So after training, the deep neural network actually has more power at the low frequency and less power at high frequency on the whole data points. So this blue data points is this blue line is extremely different uh, from this uh, green line. So for such high frequency dominant function, the deep neural networks naturally cannot well uh, performed or cannot generalize to unseen data. So to consider generalization, we definitely need to consider the bias of the method and also the property of data. In real data set, most of the data are dominated by low frequency. And the neural network is also biased uh, towards low frequency. So in this consistency, so neural network can perform quite well in real data. But for some, but this is definitely is not a, uh, uh, almighty. <clears throat> Just like a free, uh, no free lunch theorem said. So for high frequency dominant function, neural network cannot perform well. So if you have such task and you cannot perform well, so you really don't waste the time to tune parameters because it's some intrinsic difficult. Now, we try to understand more about the, why we need a deep neural network, not just a shallow neural networks from Fourier perspective. So as we know that uh, the deep neural network has some effect like uh, the generalization and speed, right? So as we have shown that if you uh, avoid the, the gradient dissipation, uh, dis, uh, dispersion, disappear uh, during the training, uh, you can see that deep neural network can generalize better and training faster but why we really don't understand it so far 
So people have shown that if you have more layers, you can always perform uh, much better. And we also have some examples to show uh, to get uh, to let the training faster uh, by increasing the number of la hidden layers. For example, you try to fit a function cosine three x and cos plus cosine five x. If we increase the number of hidden layers, the number of training steps to a fixed error uh, decrease as the number of layers increase. And we have another example. Suppose you fix some neural networks, okay? And now you will try to fit a different target function, okay? So this is a previous uh, picture in this one. And now we similarly, but not so similarly, we change the target function, lower and lower frequency. As the frequency principle has said, for a fixed neural network, the training steps will decrease. So these two curves are quite similar, right? So we have a conjecture that is deep frequency principle. The effective target function for a deeper hidden layer is a lower frequency function. So how to understand this? So if you uh, try to fit a fixed function, a target function, it has a very high frequency components. When you increase the hidden layers, so the, the layers more deeper for this kind of deeper hidden layer. Its target function is very low frequency, right? So you will learn it very fast. So just this is due to the frequency principle we have empirical and theoretically verified. So now we need to verify this frequency, uh, deep frequency principle. So this is also kind of um, easier to study the effect of depth because frequency is easier to be quantified for theoretical study. And this actually is very consistent with our um, kind of common understandings. If you just like support a vector machine, if you project the data into a higher space, it will be easier to be classified by some linear method, right? We just try to quantify this effect by uh, frequency. So as we know, this has uh, some effects, generation effect. Uh, sorry. OK, here. Yeah. So how to um, characterize the deep frequency principle? We need to uh, kind of um, characterize how the distribution of frequency in of a high dimensional function. So the idea we use is we try to characterize the low frequency ratio, such as um, for high frequency function, we consider radially uh, inside some uh, radius, how much frequency this function uh, the power of the, this function can concentrate on this uh, uh, radius, on, on this ball in high, frequency, in high dimension. Now let's take an example. Okay, so you can uh, convolve a function in spatial domain, uh, which is equivalent to doing a product of function in spatial domain. So this g here, uh, originally, or uh, it should be kind of indicated function, but it's extremely hard or suffer from curse of dimensionality. So we use a Gaussian uh, function to approximate this um, uh, indicate, indicated function. So you can get that this low frequency part, and you can convolve in discretized way. And you can uh, perform this uh, ratio of the power of the low frequency function uh, with respect to the whole function. You get a LFR to approximate this indicator function case. So in the ex experiment, we use this approximate case. So now let's talk about a bit more about a Gaussian function. So this Gaussian function, if you perform a Fourier transform, you can see the width of this uh, spatial domain, uh, Gaussian function in spatial domain, actually is uh, it, um, different from the width of the and the function in spatial domain. First, it's still a Gaussian function, but the width now is 1 over delta. So 1 over delta actually is in the width of uh, how much uh, frequency you kept in the low frequency part. You can uh, approximately understand it in this way. So now let's take a look at this low frequency uh, ratio. So for uh, kind of different sine kx, 
sine k pi x. As we can see, this LFR, if you have a low frequency function, the LFR uh, approximate uh, 1 much faster than high frequency function. So just uh, very similar to this um, probability distribution function, we can define a ratio distribution function. And this one can be defined by this uh, partial LFR uh, over partial uh, k. So we can we use um, uh, uh, we use a slope of uh, consecutive points to define this uh, ratio distribution function. So as we can see that for low frequency, uh, the peak is uh, closer to zero. Higher frequency, the peak is higher. Uh, so this RDF can, in some sense, reflect the frequency, the frequency distribution of high dimensional function. Okay, so uh, we can characterize the RDF ratio distribution function of uh, this uh, uh, each high dimensional function or each hidden layer during the training. Now let's explain what's the meaning of this uh, effective target function for different hidden layer. So now let's take a look at this uh, neural network structure. We decompose this neural network into two parts. One is a preconditioned part indicated by red data point, red uh, circles. <clears throat> the other is the learning component. So we just understand this uh, for this uh, fully connected neural network or convolution anyway, just a neural network. You compose it, uh, decompose it into two parts. So this part, okay, for fixed step, we just uh, uh, understand that this is just a precondition of the data. And the learning part, what we care about is these blue data points. So the effective target function for these blue uh, data points is that the input is the output of this uh, uh, layer L minus, L minus 1. And the, and the labels that this component will learn is the true label. So the target function for this uh, learning component, effective target function for this uh, this hidden layer, maybe we said for this hidden layer, is the output of layer minus one, L minus one, and the true label. Okay, so yeah, just like here, the effective target function, the training data, effective training data. So now let's take a look. If you increase the number of hidden layers here, and the uh, effective target function becomes more and more, uh, much and much lower function, then it will be easier for this component to learn this function, right? So you will learn faster. So now the meaning of faster here, we mean the training steps. Although we know if you increase the number of layers, you will increase the computational cost. But here we don't consider the difference of uh, one step of computational cost we consider the number of steps to define the training speed. Okay, so our deep frequency principle actually says if you increase the number of hidden layers, the effective target function of this learning component actually will become a lower frequency function. Now let's take a look at how we perform these experiments. So uh, we actually use some variants of ResNet 18. And you can uh, the minus one part is uh, the structure is here. And for minus two structure, second structure, we just uh, delete this um, yellow part. The third structure, we delete uh, this, um, uh, this second part. And for the final one, we also delete uh, this cyan part. So for uh, like, uh, so we delete more and more parts, more and more parts, okay. And we examine the effective function, target function for this um, uh, final fully connected layer, this part, final fully connected layer. So all the previous one actually are regarded as preconditioned layer. So uh, our experiment shows that if the network is deeper, you will learn faster and generalize better. So learn faster means uh, increase faster, the accuracy increase faster. And Generalized beta means um, the final generation error increase, uh, is 
is larger, the accuracy is larger for deeper neural network. Now let's take a look at the effective target function of last two layers. So as we can see that this is the first epoch, uh, no, uh, initial epoch. The deeper, deeper structure actually peaks at a higher frequency, right? This one, uh, my one over there actually just can be regarded as frequency. And uh, the shallow networks actually uh, peaks at a lower frequency. But during the training, as the training evolves, <clears throat> you can see that the deeper neural networks, minus one is deeper, will uh, move towards lower frequency, a lower frequency. And at the end of training, the deeper neural network peaks at the lowest frequency, followed by the second <coughs> network, and third, and fourth. So you can see that a deeper neural network actually has a deeper, um, has a lower frequency component. So this is the movie. Yeah, you can see during the training, the deeper neural network towards lower frequency. So we have this deep frequency principle. The effective target function for a deeper hidden layer has a bias towards a function with more low frequency during the training. So this example actually cross different network structure, but for a simple or for fixed neural network, how about the effective target function of different layers? Why we consider one end work? Because this will be, this will be easier for uh, analyze. So we can see that at least the data set fully connected. And can see that the LFR or RDF um, for different hidden layers and true labels. And we found the deeper layers, the target function will have more low frequency. Now here is an example. So, okay. Now let's explain what's the meaning of this uh, picture. <clears throat> This actually is the same as the previous one. So layer five means the fifth. Okay, sorry, the fifth layer. Okay, uh, layer one, layer two, layer three, layer four, layer five. Just the different hidden layers, the effective target function. So at the end of training, and the beginning of training. Now let's take a look. At the beginning of training, the layer five more hidden layer peaks at a uh, higher frequency, very similar as previous example. And during the training, it will move towards lower and lower frequency, lower and lower, lower and lower. And at the end of, <clears throat> at the end of training, the the most deep hidden layer, the deepest hidden layer, peaks at the lowest frequency, and the <clears throat> shallow hidden layer actually peaks at high frequency. So this is also consistent with our previous result on different network structures. So this try to explain that why you have more hidden layers, you can uh, learn faster. By this frequency principle, you can directly obtain this uh, different learning speed uh, result. But the question is for generalization. So far for generalization is uh, kind of complicated to uh, characterize this high frequency function on whole domain. Uh, we are still trying on this result. So <clears throat> up here, we have shown this frequency principle and, and its understanding for deep neural networks. And we also utilize this to understand why we need the deep. Finally, we, sh finally, we show an example to show uh, the, uh, or how we can uh, utilize frequency principle to design the neural networks. So as we know that neural networks cannot learn high frequencies and in some um, differential equations, high frequency may be important. So now let's take an example of how to solve uh, uh, differential equation uh, from this neural network approach. So suppose you consider a, a Poisson equation. In this equation, you can solve this equation by this finite difference approach. The finite difference scheme uh, can be like central difference. Um, this yields a linear system and you just solve the, this linear system. And if this linear system is very large, uh, you need to do, use some iterative solver and low frequency converts slower. This is very different from deep neural network. And for neural networks, you can solve this by this deep risk method. You can construct a loss function by the risk variation um, um, form. 
By minimizing this loss function, you can derive a solution of this Poisson equation. So you naturally have a loss function. You can solve this by deep neural networks. In the input is uh, in x and the output is a uh, function value. So now let's take a look of this uh, uncomplic complicated uh, example. In this example, uh, similarly, the x is turning epoch, and we can see the three uh, frequency peaks of the final solution. As we can see that for Jacob B iteration or traditional method, higher frequency actually converge faster. But for deep neural network, low frequency converge faster. So if you want to utilize the deep neural network to solve this uh, equation, uh, definitely you cannot solve high frequency ones. Um, why we use deep neural network? Because it potentially can solve very high frequency, a very high dimension problem, which cannot be done by traditional method. So this is a very potential uh, promising one. So, but this suffers from high frequency curves. How can we solve it? So one idea is you just uh, uh, just uh, scaling uh, this function. If you have function like alpha k, you can use uh, alpha to scaling it to k. Uh, in a spatial domain, this is just a scaling uh, scaling issue. So our problem, our, our solution is try to <clears throat> use different scaling. Like the input is x, we have a sub-network to deal with x, another sub-network to deal with 2x, and the n sub-network to deal with nx. So we uh, kind of endorse this neural network's ability to solve this problem in different scale. And finally, we combine all this output into uh, a y to fit in the final solution or the target function. Now, the advantage of this uh, uh, structure is we can uniformly converge for each frequency. We <clears throat> and this method is actually using deep neural network is a mesh free, so you can solve very complex domain and it's easy to implement it. So take a look at an example. In this example, Poisson equation, uh, the exact solution is uh, very oscillated and does not have a, have a fixed uh, frequency. So you can see that uh, there's a lot of oscillation. If you only use a normal fully connected, a lot of oscillation cannot be captured, such as uh, those in the circle and those in the corners. But if you use multi-scale, uh, you can capture almost all frequency, all fluctuations. And then from the arrow, we, we can see that the multi-scale neural network decrease faster to a smaller uh, value for 2D problem or 3D problem. And finally, uh, we, okay, give you, uh, you again, uh, take away information. We have shown a frequency principle that the neural networks prefer low frequency during the training. It learns low frequency faster and try to uh, use a low frequency to fit the training data. And our recent result, uh, deep frequency principle, it, share, it says, the effective target function for deeper hidden layer is a low frequency function. So this try to understand why a deep neural network can uh, learn a target function uh, much faster and generalize better. Uh, <clears throat> and you can uh, search, uh, come to my uh, website and we, as in this talk actually we have showed a different uh, uh, notation in one work. Um, this because we at a different time we read a kind of different uh, uh, type of paper and we adopt a different uh, notation. We found that it's kind of chaos to remember or to communicate. So recently we have uh, uh, suggested a notation for machine learning and try to uh, rewrite all of our works into a consistent notation. And since that work for now is not too much, so it's almost done. And finally, uh, thank you. And the final con conclusion is the neural network prefers low frequency. And uh, uh, thanks my uh, collaborators. Um, welcome if you have any other problems. Thanks.